going to put up our survey questions for finishing this up. Uh, see, she just covered our screen up with one of them. You know, we'll get this under control. But if you haven't answered the first three, please go ahead and do that now. And I think she will have others to place on the screen in just a couple of minutes. Um, we're going to start with a question from Kent Woodmanson. Uh, Kevin and Sean, you may be able to see those in the, your chat box. Uh, Kent is asking, are there any studies ongoing or planned to determine average manure volume reduction using a compost dairy barn for the purpose of more accurately determining manure storage bar volume requirements? Kevin, do you have your microphone on? I guess I have to hold this now. Um, the, uh, that's not one of the topics that we're focusing on. Most of it is trying to get the handle on the nutrient levels and um, what's the impact on the cropland as it's uh, land applied and, and okay, used so for land. I'm afraid we don't have an answer to that particular issue. Uh, you did mention that a 25 percent to a third of the manure is in that alley, uh, the, the uh, feed alley, so that you would still size that based upon our current estimates. Is that correct? Well, that, that information is mainly used for figuring out uh, what kind of storage, uh, external storage you might need to have. So if you're going to uh, put this in a, a storage outside and you wanted to have a year's capacity, that gives you sort of a handle on, on that material. Um, the, uh, that'll be the main use of that. And it also gives you a sort of an indication of, of what kind of nutrient levels you think you're going to be finding in the... Uh, Ron pack. Sheffield has kind of a follow-up question for that. Uh, you mentioned that uh, with this four foot of depth of storage in that compost or in the bedded area or the lounging area for the animals, how many months of storage does that actually provide? The, um, we're, what, what most producers are doing here in the upper Midwest is they're probably taking out a third or a half in the spring before they uh, plant crops. And then in the fall, they'll take it all out and, and start with a new fresh. So it's, it's not providing a full year of storage in the upper Midwest. Uh, but it clearly can get everyone through the uh, the winter. We cycle. also had a question from Les Everett. Uh, and it's more of a comment, and maybe just ask your reaction to this. The compost barn, dairy barn manure has a high ammonia content, so uh, the manure needs to be incorporated very soon after land application, according to Michael Russell. Do you concur with that statement? Oh yes, Les is working with Mike Russell on that project, and uh, yeah, they they're again one of the things they're trying to accomplish and push for is better nutrient utilization of that nitrogen, and so to to maintain that what the nitrogen that is in there uh, that surprised uh, me a little bit. Uh, generally, when we compost manure, we tend to drive off a lot of the ammonia or tie it up with organic matter. So I was a little surprised to see that, but that's good to know. I, I do appreciate people posting information in the chat box to share with us and comments like that. So, Les, thank you for sharing that today. Uh, Alan Shank has a, a question here. Uh, how does the fixed and variable cost of the, this system compare to waste lagoons? And i assuming he's talking about the dairy facility. Kevin, do you want to make any comments? The, uh, well, the, uh, I guess we've not compared it to a, uh, a storage facility. The, uh, many of our producers that are, that are building these kinds of barns do not have an external storage or they'll have a very small one. And this gives them an, uh, 
and a way of uh, expanding their operation without uh, having to change that storage operation. The, the question that we get more commonly is what's the uh, com cost comparison between this type of barn and a typical naturally ventilated freestall barn. And the, that is, that's, to steal Sean's uh, comment, uh, the, the answer is we really don't know. I've had builders tell me that they can build these uh, compost barns for less than a, the price of a uh, freestall barn, and we've had others that have come back and said, no, it's much more expensive. So it's, uh, it's not an answer that we've, uh, or we, it's not a question that we've got an answer to. Uh, well, I see that Jill is putting up polling pods. Uh, to get a little bit of feedback on the webcast today, we would much appreciate uh, your feedback or answering those questions while we uh, visit more here. Uh, Sean, I'm going to ask that same question of you. Uh, you shared some cost comparisons of an open lot versus a uh, bedded barn. Uh, if, if Did that open lot include the cost of a runoff holding pond, and if it did not, how would that compare once you included the cost of the holding pond? Yes, the upper range on the open feedlot costs that I shared would probably include the environmental control costs for the holding pond. So uh, compared to an open lot, uh, the bedded buildings are still going to be slightly more expensive to build. Uh, and it kind of comes back to a question that uh, Patty had asked in the chat box too then. So what's the incentive for doing this? If the performance change isn't enough to pay for the difference, why would you consider this? And I think it comes back in many cases to environmental pressures, um, people considering that uh, even though it may be slightly more expensive than a holding pond, I may be in a location where I just couldn't get approval uh, either environmentally couldn't get the approval to put in a holding pond or uh, social pressure from neighbors may not allow me to put in a holding pond. Thank you for those comments. Uh, all right, I saw one uh, question just scroll off the screen from uh, Steve. Uh, I won't try his last name, I'm, I'll mess it up. Is any kind of wood sawdust acceptable? Uh, hardwood versus pine? Kevin, do you have any comments there? Uh, that's right now. We're using uh, both kinds, or whatever the producers uh, can get. We've got uh, a variety of things. Um, I believe that uh, there's been some work by um, some of my colleagues that uh, that would suggest one or the other. And but I'm I'm not up on, on which one works best. I we use either kind. Other than we avoid cedar, we'll, we'll save that uh, cedar for the our hot rooms, I guess. <laughs> uh, let's see. Alan Shank has a question: How does the fixed and variable cost of this system compare to? Well, we, we've already done with that one. I'm sorry. And Patty Kale, what is motivating producers? I guess that was a question that you've already answered, Sean. Sorry, I'm should have read ahead here. Hey, okay, Chuck. Uh, questions. Uh, please ask Kevin to comment about the starting, about starting the compost pack early enough uh, in the fall to, to start the compost action. The uh, the reason that we're doing well, we will tell stories. Uh, because again, we, we hear these stories. Uh, we on campus decided to remodel a building and make part of that a compost barn. Well, as most uh, academic institutions, we didn't get that work all done until like uh, December or January of last year, and so we started it. It's very, very hard to get the biological activity going in cold weather. Our compost uh, expert that works with us uh, tells us, suggests that you should start them uh, by September, by early October at the latest, to get this uh, biological activity going, and so it'll go through uh, the cold weather that we have here in the okay, upper great. Midwest. Uh, Rick, if I, I you want me to answer a couple of those last two questions there, Rick? 
Uh, why don't we go ahead and take Bruce's and then I'll let you answer the next two. Um, Kevin, uh, observations on cow longevity? The, um, that's still being, uh, we're, we're still collecting information on that. There is, clearly we expect that. Um, there's been, uh, again, one of our extension colleagues has, has put together some numbers to, to, to look at that. Uh, we've got a project going on right now where uh, one of my colleagues is out monitoring cow uh, the uh, lameness, their mobility, and comparing it in this compost berry barns versus other types of barns. And we'll be getting more information on that. But we do believe that there will be a, a longer uh, longevity in, the, in these compost barns. We hear stories again about producers that if they have both kinds of facilities, They'll take the uh, cow that's got some lameness and they'll put her in the compost barn uh, until she can. Hey, Sean, uh, I'll let you maybe. Re I'm going to jump in here. Uh, Very good. Uh, Dave's question about labor requirements, you have to keep in mind that our building is small pens, 40 head pens, and that always increases labor to have small pens to work through. But we're finding basically no difference between our comparison facility, the open lot with the building over the bunk, and the bedded building. Uh, we're running around one and a quarter hours per week per hundred head in both of those two buildings for bedding management, cattle movement out of the way, and uh, scraping and bedding. Uh, so uh, that was one of the things that surprised us, that we, we really don't see any additional labor compared to an open lot where uh, frequent scraping is done in the open lot pens. And some bedding is used in our open lot, too, in extreme weather. Uh, Following up with the next question then about biogas recovery, uh, certainly if you were trying to do biogas recovery, you'd want to maximize the amount of manure you could collect. And I'm not sure that these bedding pack buildings are going to work very well with that. Uh, the scrape off the feed alley clearly could go into a, a recovery system. But the amount of bedding added in the bedding pack, I suspect, would cause problems there. It's just not going to be flowable enough manure to work with. Uh, Talking about the, the labor requirements, she makes a really good point, and we have seen the exact same thing in our facility, that the labor requirements are more predictable on the bedded buildings than they are on open lots, because you are much less susceptible to weather changes with your labor requirements. So it's much easier to schedule that uh, I'm going to plan to scrape that uh, apron off uh, every Tuesday or something like that and uh, stick to a schedule and know in advance about what it's going to require. You don't have the drastic up and down with weather conditions. OK, I think uh, if there's any other questions, why don't you put those up quickly. Uh, we will be saving these questions, uh, passing them on to Kevin and Sean, asking them to provide a written response. Uh, probably won't appear on our existing website, but they will go into a frequently asked questions site on our new uh, e-extension site. So that's where you'll be able to pick up their, their written response to some of these. Were there any other questions that we failed to uh, touch on today? I think with that, we're going to draw today to a, a conclusion. I really appreciate Kevin and Sean joining us today, sharing their expertise and their experience in working with these dry manure systems. I think it's a, an option that many of us are, are looking at more and more seriously as we try to deal with some of the environmental challenges that we're having. And it may be, as uh, Sean was suggesting today, these will be in part encouraged because of some of the environmental advantages that they have. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we hope that you'll return to one of our future webcasts, including one on ethanol byproduct use and its impact on nutrient management plans that we'll be doing on the 15th of February. That's all for today. Uh, hope you all have a, a good, good weekend. And uh, 
Thank you for today.